Hey guys, welcome to the Bearded Talk podcast, where our goal is to help you take your dream and turn it into a sustainable business. Uh, guys, super excited about this episode. Tyler McCall, who is an Instagram marketing expert, uh, which is amazing. He's a great guy. He's got a wonderful personality. He's just so joyful, and obviously I love that. Uh, but secondly, he specializes in helping brands tell their story through Instagram, but then also converting your followers into paying clients, you know, which I think for a lot of us, especially as visual creatives, that's that's our goal right there. And so I, I absolutely love that about him. I've even had a session with him before and it, it's helped me tremendously. And uh, I think honestly something just, you know, when I have clients that find me on Instagram and hire me, they're not necessarily better or worse than my clients that find me through word of mouth, but they, Instagram is where I post the most. Instagram is where I'm the most active. And so they have a different sense of, who I am, maybe a more authentic sense of who I am. And, uh, that makes me, they, they already come in knowing a certain level about my work and we don't have to like start at the same place as uh, many other clients. So it's really cool. And it's really valuable guys, if you haven't pursued that. So, uh, and Tyler's going to share some things that will hopefully show you that it's pretty easy to do. So anyway, here's Tyler McCall and let's go. Tyler, how's it going, man? Good, good. How are you? Good, man. It's uh, I'm super excited to chat with you. I know we had a session together, and uh, I'm loving Instagram even more and feel more authentic about it. But uh, what's going on with you, man? Well, I actually just got back to Chicago from a, a weekend trip back to North Carolina, where we just moved from a few weeks ago. So it's been a very busy few weeks, but uh, one of my best friends got married. I got to officiate her wedding, which was the coolest thing. So just got back from that and then heading to New York this week uh, to film an Instagram course with Skillshare, which is super exciting as well. That is super awesome. How did uh, how did the Skillshare thing work out? Did they approach you or how's that work? Yeah, it's a pretty crazy thing. I actually approached um, Iconosquare, which I've been using for probably a year now and and chatted with them about doing a brand partnership and they, they're in. So um, Iconosquare and I are partnering together over the next year and part of that is working with Skillshare to create an Iconosquare branded Instagram class on the Skillshare platform. So lots of cool stuff happening over there. I love that. And you said that so well, I feel like that would have been a tongue twister for me. So, uh, <laughs> that's awesome. And then, uh, so I've told everybody that you're an Instagram marketing expert and also just a branding specialist as well. But, uh, I believe your main goal is helping folks, one, tell their story and then two, creating, uh, clients out of followers. Mm -hmm. Uh, can you fill in some gaps with that? Definitely. Yeah. So, so Instagram has kind of been the mechanism I've used to do that for the past, I would say over two years now, um, with one of a business I started, um, back in 2015. So Instagram's kind of been the tool that I've used to do the work of branding and marketing my businesses. And then at this point, it's really cool because I get to help other folks do that and, and teach them how to use Instagram and social media overall, um, in a really genuine way, um, in a way that that is pretty effortless for them. I'm a big believer in creating systems and, and ways that make all of this more easy to manage. And it's also super intentional. So I think we get lost a lot of times in the game of marketing our business and we don't really know why we're doing it or what we're doing or how we're doing it. So I believe in that intentionality behind what we're doing. So, so that's what I do. That's what I teach my students and help my clients with. And, and the, really my big goal, like my big, hairy, scary goal that I'm working toward is this idea of like growing our creative economy, right? Like creating more jobs, more opportunity, more profitability for creatives by better marketing our businesses. Awesome. I love that. And a lot of people aren't thinking like, you know, if we make Instagram better, then we'll make the whole, you know, economy for the creatives better. But uh, like our good friend, Natalie Frank says, the rising tide lifts all boats. So that's, uh, mm -hmm. that's pretty awesome. So tell me a little bit more about how did you get insta into Instagram? How did you become, uh, you know, an expert? And, uh, you know, did you have a full time job before? How was that transition? Walk me through that. <laughs> 
Yeah. So I worked um, right out of college uh, for the YMCA. So back in 2010, I went to work for the Y right out of school. I actually was a part of this crazy cool program at my college where I minored in YMCA studies, which is not a really common thing. (laughs) That is insane. That's amazing. (laughs) Yeah, it's really cool. So what they did is they took all these trainings that Y professionals would typically take. Then I took them in the classroom. So learned about volunteerism and budgeting and strategic planning and marketing and and program development, which was incredible, incredible program. So right out of school, I went to work for the YMCA. I interned for the YMCA through college, traveled locally, nationally and internationally with the YMCA um, for my my four years in undergrad and then immediately went to work for the Y. And that's what I did pretty much from the day I graduated, actually the week after I graduated college, I went right to work at the Y and stayed there until the fall of 2016. And then I had a few stints away from the Y. I quit the Y at one point and said, I'm never going back and <laughs> and went to be a political organizer and then went to grad school once and um, and and kind of got kicked out and then went to grad school again and then kind of failed out. And then I was like, okay, I'm not gonna do the grad school thing. It's not working for me. And then went back to the Y because it's what I knew and it's what I loved. I mean, the Y is an incredible organization. And then what I love so much about the YMCA is it's really based on people, right? Like there's Ys are doing different things around the world in different ways. Some are fitness, some are health, some are through children, some are through swim lessons, whatever. But it's all about people at the end of the day. And that's what I was really drawn to. And then in 2015, I started an online business. I was making and selling my own room and linen spray. It was called Mr. McCall's fine fragrances. You can actually go look at Mr. McCall's on Instagram and find it. And I've had so many side gigs. I had that. I was a wedding planner for a minute, which I don't know how the hell people do that. That is like the worst job I've ever had. (laughs) It's pretty tough. Um, Yeah. The worst. And then, like, I have so much respect for wedding planners. And then I had a grocery delivery business that I started and ran for a while. I um, did Mr. McCall's. I've been a blogger. I've had multiple blogs, lifestyle blogs, home decor blogs. Um, I ran an underground newspaper in my college hometown. I started and ran a nonprofit with a friend. So I've done so many things. But at the end of the day, all of the things I've done were always rooted in and utilized social media. Like, that was the mechanism that we used to market at what we were doing or to connect with more people. Um, back in the day, it was Twitter when I was doing uh, nonprofit work and political organizing and campaigning in rural North Carolina around um, LGBT equality. We were working on Twitter like that was the thing that you had access to. Everyone could do it. It was quick. It was easy. You didn't have to have great sales service. You could tweet from your from by texting. So that was the thing that we used. And then it grew over time into Instagram. In 2015, when I launched Mr. McCall's, I went on Instagram to build out my presence there. And it was incredible. I was able to connect with so many bloggers and influencers at that time, you know, two years ago on Instagram, it was really a new world for this idea of influence and social influence and what it meant to be a person of influence on the platform. And I was able to build really meaningful relationships with people with tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of followers with my account with like 800 followers and photos I taken on my iPhone that were like terrible photos. And I built that business and then, um, moved into 2016, left my corporate job at the Y at the end of 2016, or no, at the end of 2015. Wow, my years are so confused. Gosh, we're (laughs) old. I feel so old right now. Um, (laughs) Left my corporate gig at the end of 2015, went full time, beginning of 2016. Um, Yeah, and I've just been trucking along since then. It's crazy to think it's almost two years that I've been full time entrepreneur, and I kind of can't believe it. but that transition from full-time corporate work to entrepreneurship was, for me, it was pretty seamless. Like my partner and I did the work of saving money and being prepared. And then I got into entrepreneurship and I had that nice cushion. So I was just like, I'll just do whatever the hell I want for six months. So I didn't make any <laughs> money because I had savings and I had credit cards that I could put my Starbucks on. So that <laughs> happened. Um, So it's been a learning experience. Like my first year, last year was my first year and, and it was great. But this year is where everything's really started to come together Mm. in 2017. I love that. It's, it's so funny. So, uh, and we don't have to dive into that because I don't, you know, everybody wants to hear about Instagram, but, uh, 
I was kicked out of college uh, in undergrad. Uh, and I talk about that in my first episode. And that's kind of how I became a photographer, kind of through my time off and stuff like that. And so uh, we're brothers in arms, Tyler, brothers in arms. <laughs> yes. <laughs> what, a, what are some things, um, working at the YMCA, were you doing marketing for the YMCA? So I had a really interesting career path there. I started in... Um, and membership is what I did. So I started in, in membership coordination. So uh, managing the front desk was pretty much what I did. And then I left a, a, an, a the YMCA works at um, in the form of associations. So each community has their own association. So you have the YMCA of DC. We have the YMCA of Chicago here. Um, some Y associations are standalone. Some are massive. So I worked as part of an association out of college. Left that and moved to Asheville, and then got into another association. And at that point, point, I had to just start back at the, the bottom. So started as a membership representative working at the front desk within six months, became the lead membership rep within six months from that became a membership manager. And then within about four months became a district director. And so at that point I had three facilities I supervised. I had around 30 staff and I managed around a $15 million membership budget, which was an incredible opportunity. I was also 25 and did not know what the hell I was doing. So <laughs> I was totally making it up as I was going going along and then through that job, I also did a lot of training and leadership development. So I worked with a colleague to create all of the customer service training for our association and trained hundreds of frontline employees on how to deliver outstanding customer service experiences. And then I moved to the marketing team um, about six months before I left and was probably, that was probably the worst decision of my YMCA career, but probably the best decision of my, my personal career because it gave me the nudge I needed to get out of there. Um, but it was, it was a big change in the why there's kind of two distinct folks. There's facility folks and then there are corporate folks. So facility folks were in the facility. We are talking to members. We're dealing with, you know, people falling off treadmills and having too many kids and like in the babysitting where you have to go like watch kids for an hour. Um, in the corporate world, you're just sitting in a cubicle with no lights and no people around you. And it was the worst thing ever. Mm. So I hated it for my career, but it was the nudge I needed to get out of there and go do my own thing totally that's awesome i uh i it already sounds to me because i mean i know a little bit about your story but you even just in your you have a facebook group right now mm -hmm. uh which we'll link to in the show notes uh and then you're starting uh we'll get to this in a little bit but you're starting a collective group which we'll reveal the name of later but um all of these things kind of show me uh, like customer service and membership coordination and stuff like that like those skills and things like that seem to kind of echoed into your job now, you know, like I feel like people learn, uh, these kind of skills that aren't necessarily the main skill, quote unquote, um, that become a strength when they go on their own, you know? And I think that mm -hmm. for you, that's really valuable. Um, for me, it's always been communication and just, you know, being able to communicate well, uh, or at least that's what I think it's my strength <laughs> is. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and so having that kind of strength kind of helps carry the other, you know, up and coming talents that you're trying to, you know, move along, move along and stuff like that. Um, trying to uh, get back down into to Instagram for folks. Do you think that one, do you still love Instagram? And then two, do you think Instagram marketing and influence can, influencing can work for everybody? Yeah, that's such a good question. So. I'm sure you know, as most of the folks listening to this, Instagram has gone through a major shift this year, especially summer of 2017. We've seen a huge change on the platform. And, and I think there's a few things happening there. I don't think it's just Instagram. I think the way that we're marketing businesses have shifted. I think the way consumers are spending money has changed. I think, I think a lot shifting in our, our world around economy and trade and those things. And, and that's influencing what's happening on Instagram. <clears throat> I still love Instagram. I think it is an incredibly powerful platform for connection and community. And I think the shift on Instagram recently, the, the biggest thing I'm hearing from folks is that there's been a decrease in their likes or a decrease in engagement. And that really scares people. 
And I get that. I mean, I'm someone who's always talked about the importance of measuring engagement on Instagram over anything else, that the number of followers you have doesn't matter. It's the rate at which those followers engage with your content that you want to track and monitor uh, to really help you understand if what you're doing is the right thing to do. But I think what we've gotten lost in is this idea that more is better, more engagement is better, more likes are better, more followers are better. At the end of the end of the day, what I talk with folks about is first of all, trying to attract the right people. A lot of people don't know who they're trying to attract. They're just putting content out there for everyone. I see this as a, a huge, a huge problem in the wedding industry, right? I know, I know Natalie talks about this a lot as well. And then the stuff that she does is like, don't try and replicate what Natalie Frank does to attract followers on Instagram. The same, don't try and, and replicate what I do to attract followers on Instagram because I'm trying to attract wedding professionals as potential clients. However, wedding professionals need to attract, a, you know, either a bride or a groom or a wedding planner or a venue who will refer them out. And, and a lot of times they're getting lost in that and just building up a community of other photographers or videographers. And that may not help them in the long run. So I think you have to know clearly who you're trying to attract and then you have to create content for that person and for that person alone, right? So this idea of marketing to one, which a lot of people are scared to do, but when you do it, that's when the work that you're doing really starts to come to life and it comes, it kind of goes to the next level for you. And then the last thing is just talking to the people who are already there. So instead of getting so hung up and trying to bring new folks in, talk to the folks who are already with you and who are going to stick around. So we know like it is, it is a proven fact. I know this from my days in the YMCA that it is much more uh, affordable, much more budget conscious to retain the members or customers or followers that you have than trying to go out and attract new folks. And a lot of folks, especially creatives aren't looking at their cost of acquisition don't understand that every minute they're putting into trying to do X, Y, and Z to get one more follower who may potentially be a customer or client has a direct cost to their business. So instead of trying to do all that all the time, focus on talking to the people who are already there. So that's the big shift I've seen in Instagram. Now, does it work for all businesses? I don't think it does. I think um, I think Instagram is really powerful, but there's some folks where it may not work as well. At the end of the day, no matter what type of business you have on Instagram, the focus has to be on getting folks off of that platform. So instead of spending so much time and energy on always trying to measure the success on Instagram through a sell on Instagram, focus on moving your follower from Instagram to another location. So either to a Facebook group or to a blog post or an email list or a download, something like that, because you have to take them through this process. I call it this framework from follower to fan. So how do we move them from a passive follower? I, I like to call them lurkers and then convert them to likers and then commenters and then fans of what you're doing online. And if you can move the folks through that continuum, you're much more likely to have the result of converting to a customer or client than just creating content and hoping it sticks. Totally. That was, uh, that was a lot of information, Tyler. I love that. that was it was a lot. Listen, I'm very verbose and I talk way too much. So <laughs> I love it. But that was, you know, that was like, part of our I know our interaction in our meeting when uh we met to talk about my Instagram and uh like I remember all of those those tips <laughs> um do you think that there is you know it what if somebody doesn't have that place to go off to uh or they haven't really built that out I know a lot of people uh that we look up to seem to already have it made up you know like I put you in the same category as like Amy Porterfield with uh, just having like lead pages set up and all kinds of uh, technological magic. Uh, what is something somebody can do to kind of like that is easier to start off with and, and kind of get that flow going or what should they aim for, you know, in in like a say a four week plan, if you will. Mm -hmm. I love this question so much. And I also love that you compare me to Amy Porterfield because <laughs> you're welcome. <laughs> if anyone who follows me knows she is like my like marketing Yoda. I'm I, I just I love the content that she produces and love the way that she shows up in her business. It's incredible. So thanks for that. Yeah. Um, 
That's such a good question because I think it is easy to look at folks who have it all together, right? And, and be like, oh my God, I don't have all that. I don't have the capital to invest in that. I don't have the time to create those systems or purchase lead pages, which I had lead pages. I actually just canceled my subscription because I, I read profit first and realized I was spending too much money. Um, so I got rid of lead pages. But it's easy to look at that. So I think a few things that you can do is first of all, start simple and start cheap or free. So something like MailChimp or Mailer Light. Mailer Light is um, and not to be confused with Miller Light, which is perfectly fine. But Mailer Light is my new favorite email free email service because it has really gorgeous landing pages that you can create and you can create an autoresponder that connects to that landing page. So Mailer Light is kind of like um, MailChimp had has a little had like a one night stand with ConvertKit is kind of what, <laughs> how I like to think of it because um, it has a little bit of that happening. And and I really like that. So start with a tool like that and then just get in the habit of having conversations with your followers and getting them to message you or getting them to comment. That's where you have to start. Commenting and messaging is really the gateway to those um, those bigger conversations and the, and the next step in the relationship. So start incorporating questions into your post on Instagram. And it's going to feel awkward. People aren't going to respond. I get it. You got to do it. Um, put the question at the beginning of your post. Make the questions really simple. Reduce the barrier of entry for your followers. So the example I always give, I've talked about this before, is one time I asked my followers what their favorite flavor of ice cream is. And I had, I think, over 100 comments from people sharing their favorite flavor of ice cream. Listen, I love ice cream and it's really cool to hear about all these cool flavors, but I'm not dying. I wasn't like making a list. I wasn't taking a survey or a poll. I said I was getting my followers used to used to commenting on my content. That was the main goal of that of that post. So get them into that habit and then get people to direct message you their email address. I mean, it's it's the easiest thing to do and the easiest way to build your list right off of Instagram using Instagram stories in particular, and then take those email addresses, pop them into your free provider and start cranking out content for those people. It can be monthly. It can be every other week, once a week, whatever it may be. But focus on always pouring into the lives of your followers and subscribers. Remember that your goal is to positively impact them, whether they are your customer or not. So focus on building that relationship and impacting their lives. And then you're on, you're on that path. You're doing the work of building your list and, and taking the relationship to the next level without lead pages or infusion soft or any of that fancy stuff that you feel like you just have to have to get started. Awesome. Yeah, it's, it's totally right. I have a, uh, the, the DMing for a, uh, email address like totally works. I, uh, follow a photographer and I saw his work and it was really good. And, uh, he kept posting in his stories like, hey, I'm releasing a tutorial on how I edit. Uh, DM me if you want to be on the list. And so I DM'd him, put my email in there and, and didn't hear from him for a while. And then, you know, you know, like three weeks later, I got an email uh, once the course was done and I was ready to buy. I was like, all right, cool. It's the mm -hmm. right price. And uh, he had some other things set up the right way. And I was like, wow, that was so easy. Um, you know, so it, it definitely makes sense. And I think people... At least for me, uh, we'll use me as an example. I think I'm kind of trying to balance the idea of being, you know, primarily a wedding photographer and then also trying to create content that just helps other creatives at the end of the day. Uh, and we'll get into some of the kind of the real talk uh, in a few minutes. But what would your advice be for someone like me or maybe other photographers who or just folks who don't know what to what what their ask should be, if you will, mm. you know, because they don't want to be like, hey, hire me for your wedding because uh, they don't want to be that direct per se. Uh, what should we show or what what's the best thing we can do to kind of be helpful in those mindsets and through Instagram stories, if you will, and kind of get that that uh, that micro interaction started. Mm -hmm. Definitely. So I think the first thing is just having that ultimate clarity on who you're speaking to. So. Uh, if anyone is listening and they're in, the, they're in that place that I do this and this, or I'm thinking of doing this or this, or speaking to this person or that person, you, you've got to nail it down and you can't, it, it's really difficult to try and do both on the same platform. And I think folks will see 
that they're not getting the results they had hoped when they're doing that because the messaging is confusing, the audience is confused. So you have to have that clarity there. And then the next thing is focus on one of two things, either giving valuable content. So sharing, you can do tips and tricks, you can do um, behind the scenes, you can share more information about um, a lesson that the person can take away, something that positively impacts their lives through valuable educational or informational content or tell stories. Focus on the storytelling side of things. Bring people inside. Have those those moments where you take them behind the curtain and start building the relationship through storytelling um, over anything else. And that's where this idea of being a personal brand comes into play. That's where this conversation on authenticity on social media happens. It's when we start talking about how we want to show up online in a way that tells either our story or our business's story, what that story is, what parts we want to include, what parts do we not want to include. All of that, those are big personal decisions a person has to make. But I think those are the the two biggest things you can do, either start giving value or start telling stories. Hmm. Totally. I appreciate that. That's uh. It's good insight. And I mean, I even I subscribe to so many mailing lists and stuff like that from people that are the content is really simple. They're just like, hey, here's five things I'm loving this week, Um, you know, and that's all it is. And you're just kind of getting to know this person. Um, But I think a lot of people like including myself struggle with imposter syndrome where we're like, who would want to hear from me? Who would want to know the five things I'm loving right now? Mm -hmm. Um, You know, or are those five things that cool or is my behind the scenes, you know, as cool as somebody else and uh, you know, I think the the idea is, is just we just got to go go for it. You know, you just got to try mm-hmm. it. And uh, if you have more than one follower who isn't a parent or isn't a, <laughs> a supportive spouse, then it's like, uh, you know, then you should go for it. And that person might want to know. And you know, I'd, I'd be we'd all be surprised to see how many of our followers actually do want to know more about us and mm-hmm. um, kind of be taken through that place. But I know for me, it's uh, I haven't given them a place to go. Uh, for so long. And so it's, I'm trying to train my audience right now. Um, Mm -hmm. And I think I wanted to, I wanted to jump in there and say too, just remembering that there is an audience for everyone, right? So, so not thinking that what I have to say isn't valuable enough or interesting enough or, or creative or unique enough, because at the end of the day, there's always going to be someone who responds better to your content or your voice or your messaging than they do to mine. So I think that's where this idea of community over competition comes into play. That's where we, we really start to understand that competition does not truly exist because there's always an audience for us. There's always someone who will listen to what we have to say and, and it's just, doing the work of defining who that person is and getting clear on how we want to speak to them. And that's where you can really start creating content in a way that feels good to you because you know, you're, you're creating it for people who have chosen to follow you, those who are sticking around and who care about what you have to say. And then who cares about anyone else or, or speaking to anyone else or from anyone else's experience, just do you and, and do it from that position of being genuinely you. Yeah, Absolutely. Talking, uh, can let me know if you, I shouldn't ask you this question, but uh, sure. with being an entrepreneur and freelancer right now, and you can tell me as, as much as you'd like, what is your, kind of switching it up, what is your biggest income generator at the moment now, um, now that you've switched? And is it, you know, Instagram marketing? And if so, how does that work? Is that both training? Is that, do you do any influencing from a tr- traditional aspect? You know, uh, what's that breakdown for us? And you don't mm-hmm. have to use too many numbers if you don't want to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So my, uh, my biggest income source right now, and this is after I've, I've undergone a major shift in my business, um, over the past really six weeks. Um, my, my, most of my income is coming from one-on-one coaching and consulting. So I do that through either one-off sessions with individuals like what you and I did or through more structured programs like a six or a 12 week program that I do custom development for, for a client around uh, the idea of marketing 
for some folks, it's really Instagram specific. For some some folks, it's more of a an overall digital marketing approach to what they're doing on Instagram, Facebook, how they're creating that sales funnel, where they're moving their audience from, and then where they're moving them to, that whole process. Um, so those are my two. And then I have ongoing programs as well. So especially for previous clients, folks who I've worked with in either a one-off or a program setting who want ongoing support, um, I offer them monthly ongoing coaching to just keep them accountable and help them navigate this world as they're creating and and posting their content. So that's my biggest thing right now. I'm actually, I just shifted away in August from content creation and management. That was my last month of doing that. I had been doing that for nearly two years. No, actually for over two years. I had a client I started with at the end of 2015. And that was a really big income generator for me. However, my business had grown to a point where I was outsourcing most of that work. Mm-hmm. So the the revenue was great. However, the income on my side of things, you know, at the end of the month, I would pay my contractors and I was like, I made $7 and that was a <laughs> lot of work for $7. So we're not doing that anymore. <laughs> um, so I've cut that out of my portfolio, focusing on coaching and consulting and then getting ready to launch this new thing that I'm sure we'll talk about shortly. Um, and really, I'm really believing that that is, um, I'm not believing like I I know that's going to do well because my audience really needs it. And I've been I've been um, I've been listening to my audience for a long time and getting really clear on who they are and creating content for them for a long time. I mean, over two over a year now. Um, And this is this is the thing that over and over again comes up and, and continually it's a need that's not being met for them. So, so that's why I'm moving into, into the world of, of my next big project. Nice. What, uh, before we get there, what was that, that six week process that you've been going through and, um, was it, was profit the only reason or do you get a lot more joy out of coaching and teaching and stuff like that? Yeah. So it all started, um, it actually started in June and, as, as folks who have been following me um, this year know, I had a pretty crazy summer, but it started in June with me really sitting down and looking at how things are going in my business and what I wanted to do more and less of. And I had all of my clients coming up for contract renewal in August. So in July, I was having those conversations, those calls or dinners or coffees and saying, hey, I've loved working with you over the past six months or year or, or two years. Um, I think what you're doing is incredible. However, I'm not going to continue offering this service um, after August. And I would love to help you transition to something that works better, that that works just as well for your business. So transitioning, some clients um, are still working with my photographer. Some are still working with my photographer and my content manager. um, And some have just gone and done whatever they wanted, which is fine. Um, But having those breakup conversations with clients and then working really hard to book some coaching clients for the fall um, to kind of give me some of that cushion so I could transition to my next thing. And and for me, it was the profitability was huge. That was something I realized even before reading Profit First about a month ago. But also, it's totally right. Like I did not I was not getting joy anymore out of like creating editorial calendars for people and strategizing their content long term and managing like uh, a last minute post about a beer tasting or something like that. Like I was like, okay, this is real, this is real cute and fun, but like I'm ready to go on to the next thing. And, and I think leave space for someone else to do that work and allow me to move on to what I want to do more of, which is teach and coach and, and, and really lead a thought around the idea of how we can market creative businesses better. I love that. Is there a, just to touch on the one thing for the photographers listening, is that a, a viable, um, you know, outlet they should pursue is maybe any Instagram or marketing influencers and say, Hey, I'd like to, uh, you know, audition or here's my portfolio, uh, for those marketers that are, that love content creation. And then photographers that are looking into something that could be a, you know, a sustainable business that isn't necessarily, um, you know, portraits or weddings and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. If you are a wedding photographer or excuse me, if you're a photographer shooting people and 
you are overshooting people and you're ready to move on to the next thing, there is plenty of work out there for you. I think there's a this big fear in my interactions and conversations with photographers around moving from something that's so like we're so sure of weddings and portraits and births and family, moving to something like food or or content creation for a brand or, or something like that. And there's this idea that you have to be a part of an agency to do it, or you have to be connected, um, in you know, New York or a major city to do that kind of work. It's just not true. Like there is work out there for you. So the photographer that I used in Asheville, who's still working with all of our clients in Asheville, she and I had an Instagram strategy session at the end of 2016. And she said, you know, I really, um, I'm struggling because I want to be a food photographer and I want to photograph spaces and I love hotels and, and that type of work. And, and that's what I want to be doing, but I feel like I just have to do weddings and families because that's what everyone's doing. And I know that's where I get money. And I said, if you don't spend time putting out there that that's the kind of work you want to do and all you're putting out there is the wedding and families, that's all you're going to keep attracting. So you have to talk about how you want this type of work. So she started talking about how she wanted to work with small business owners and she, she locked down a few brands for six month retainer work contracts. And then when it came time for me to find a new photographer, because my business partner was my photographer and she and I split and, and she moved on to her next endeavor, um, I had a gift shop and a wedding planner who needed photos. So I called up my photographer friend I just had a session with and said, hey, I have two clients. Do you want them? And she said, yes. Then I signed on a, a hospitality company with two hotels with restaurants in both properties. And I called and said, hey. I have food and beverage and hospitality with two new clients for six months. Do you want it? And she was like, um, yes, hello. So like <laughs> she just put it out there, right? That she wanted that type of work and it came around and she was able to nail six months worth of work. I think, I mean, over two grand a month and, and doing commercial photography for these. So for Instagram clients, which was incredible. That's awesome. And she already had the skills, you know, it's not like she, you know, she had made her, portfolio good enough in one category which i think for photographers is an advantage where a lot of people think oh you're a photographer of course you would be will give you a chance at these other endeavors you know so good on her for just going for it and i love that that's awesome mm -hmm. um all right tyler we've been we've been talking for a while now tell me more about what's next for you uh you run a really successful facebook group as far as i'm concerned there's so much engagement there uh i'm i'm part of it and it's there's just so much knowledge and people on Instagram going through the same thing and talking about strategies and stuff like that. Um, and I kind of love it just because it's a subculture of itself. Tell me more about, you know, that. And then what is that moving towards? Yeah. So the Facebook group has been around since, um, March of 2017. And I started it because, I was doing a launch. I had launched a course back in the spring all around Instagram stories. And I used that group as a way to host a five day challenge. It's a really popular way to launch product. I'm sure most of you have seen that. You've probably been in like 50 of them. Um, so I started that group and then it just grew and it grew and it stayed incredibly active. And I was like, well, holy crap, like we got something good going here. But what I've noticed is, and I love the Facebook group, the Facebook group's not going anywhere. Like it's staying around. What I've noticed is I'm not able to give the level of attention I want to that group. And most folks in that group have the same problems and that we're talking about the same things over and over again. So I've been paying attention, polling that audience, talking with them about what they need. So um, in just a few weeks, uh, I'm going to be launching the Follower to Fan Society, which I'm incredibly excited about. It's been in the works for months. And this is an online membership community that is combining really the three big things that creatives need to market their businesses online. And that is education. So it's education that's relevant and that's current and that is meeting their needs. So a lot of the problems I see, I think a lot of what we see in the course world now is you buy a course on Instagram or Facebook, whatever it may be. And the moment you, you click buy, it's outdated, right? Because the platform has changed and course creators are doing the best they can to keep up with it. But you know, if you just launched a course and you sold it and you get the course out there and you're not launching it again for six months, I don't know about you, but I'm sure a lot of folks are not necessarily doing the work of updating it, you know, 
every month when these platforms are changing. So up to the minute, education is the first thing. And then resources are the next thing. So uh, the big things that I keep hearing from creatives they, that they need is editorial calendars and content plans. Like they need a clear understanding each month of what they're supposed to do or what they want to do on Instagram and Facebook. So we're going to give you that. And done for you comment pods that really, that actually work, that benefit you instead of just jumping in a comment pod from a Facebook group and hoping it does something and, and specific days that we'll utilize to boost your content up. So we're giving you that. And then the last thing is a community. So a community of people, not only where you can get support from me and, and folks that I'm going to be bringing onto my team to walk alongside you in this process. So we're going to have that through like uh, monthly hot seat calls and, and monthly guest master classes, but also this really strong community of people you can rely on and connect with through the society. So that's what we're launching in the follower to fan society. It's um, a membership site. Folks can join. Um, we'll have monthly memberships, annual and lifetime memberships where they can get access to this content that will be updated regularly. We'll be adding content as our, as our community grows and as things shift on social and then continue to support them along the way. And for me, it's really this idea of, I want to be a community builder. I want to continue to connect people with one another. One of my favorite things, especially in business is knowing who does what and connecting those folks with one another. So the, the society is going to provide a space for us to do that in a really cool and creative way and continue to do that work of growing the creative economy through those connections together. So that's why we're launching the society this fall. And I'm really excited about it. What do you think? Um, you already said kind of some of the differences between other courses and stuff like that, mm -hmm. but you know, I feel the voice in the back of my head, even though I've, I've had a session with you is, is why should somebody join the society? Uh, you know, can't they just Google, you know, how to get more Instagram followers, you know, and, uh, you know, what, who is the ideal person that is looking into follower to fan society? Yeah, I love that question. So I think the biggest takeaway I've had so far is I've been talking about this idea with my audience and, and folk friends and, and, and colleagues in the industry. The thing that people keep saying is I love this idea because that means I never have to research Instagram or Facebook again. So I think what a, a lot of times what's happening, especially as creatives is you want to create, if you're a maker or an artist, you want to make or make art. You want to take photographs and edit them. You want to make videos. Your goal is not to, to be a marketer. So why are you spending so much of your time trying to be an online marketer when you just want to make and, and do and create? So that's what this provides you is that resource where everything is in one place. So you don't have to just go Google it, Google it and hope that what you're getting access to is correct or helpful or beneficial. So for folks who are looking for that support through the education, and you want to be a part of a community, that's what this is really for. Now, if you don't care about the community component, you can still join, but I promise you, you're going to miss out on a lot of the really incredible uh, connections and growth that's going to happen through the society without accessing the community. But I also know folks are just going to join for the community and they may never log in and check out the, the educational curriculum. And that's fine as well, because they're going to get the support that they need from this community of creative entrepreneurs. I love that. So when does that launch? Do you know? So it's launching uh, end of September into the beginning of October. And we'll be we'll be opening the doors then. And uh, folks can learn more at follower to fan society dot com. That is awesome. Uh, shifting one more time. We've shifted a lot in here. But uh, I yeah. think Tyler, you just you have so much uh, knowledge. But at, at the same time, I think um, you're the same person uh, that I've seen online at the, sa and at the same time in this conversation, and I love that. And so mm -hmm. uh, I want to talk about something a little bit off the cuff, but I think a lot of people struggle with, and that's um, you know dealing with a personal life or personal issues and uh, some deep stuff. But at the same time, you also moved, you know, mm -hmm. um, recently. And so, what is that whole process been like this summer uh, through the things you've gone through? And you can kind of explain, fill in some gaps and mm -hmm. um, 
practically, how did you get back into work? Or even when you moved, like how long did it take for you guys to get your office up and running? And mm -hmm. you know, what, what were some plans that uh, you could have had in place that maybe would have made it easier to jump back in? Yeah, so... Loaded question, uh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. There's a lot of good stuff there. Um, so I guess the backstory is um, at the end of March, my father had an accident at work that um, he thought was just a back injury, but that slowly but surely got worse. And by the end of August, he um, he could no longer walk and he lost bladder function and he was really struggling for a man who... He was 55 years old who had worked his entire, I mean, he had worked with his body his entire life since he was 11 years old um, with, at the family sawmill. And he had always been active and moving and and it put him out of commission. And slowly but surely through testing and traveling and seeing specialists, we discovered that he had a spinal lesion that had ruptured and caused a whole host of really terrible symptoms um, throughout his body. And that he was not going to recover function from that that rupture in his spinal column and he elected to have surgery and uh the end of june of this year uh, to remove that lesion to prevent any future paralysis. It wasn't going to bring anything back, but just prevent it from happening again. And the surgery went well. The, the surgeon and then the team was really uh, surprised at how well everything went. And he came home and he died one week later. And um, it, it was heartbreaking. It was devastating. He was, had just turned 55 years old in April. He and my mother were together for 33 years. They would have celebrated their 33rd wedding anniversary um, just a few weeks after he died. And I, my life just came to a scree screeching halt. I mean, it just it stopped. Um, when dad got sick and he went into the hospital two days after his birthday in April, on April 26th, I kind of dropped everything I was doing and just went to be by his side and with my mother. And then as he traveled and saw specialists and was out of work for weeks on end, you know, I was checking in and visiting regularly. Um, and then whenever he had surgery, I was, I was with my mother and by his side, um, following that. And then after he died, I went and stayed with my mom for a few weeks. So my business just stopped. And, and fortunately I had, you know, my small, but extremely mighty team who, kept things moving and kept things going and incredible friends and, and folks in our industry who reached out and supported me along the way, offering whatever they could. And then my clients were also the folks that I, I had the opportunity to coach this summer and work with one-on-one -on -one were of course, incredibly understanding. And we pushed the sessions back for weeks on end and, and they were so great to work with, but that, threw a wrench into my plans. I had these grand plans of launching Follower to Fan Society prior to our move to Chicago. Um, my partner, Eric, and I have been planning a move to Chicago for months. Um, we signed a lease on our apartment to move in at the beginning of August, a week before my father passed away. So there was really no turning back like we were on this trajectory to come here and, and, and kind of reestablish ourselves in a new place. So through all of that, everything came, came to a stop. And it, it was, I think, um, I think it was helpful in part because it allowed me to really look at the landscape of my business and what I was doing. But I also lost a ton of momentum. And when Eric and I got set up in Chicago, that first week we were here, I, um, I haven't shared this with anyone yet, but I pulled up our bank accounts, um, my personal checking, Eric's account, our savings account, my business account. And I realized that we would have to take everything that we had to pay like our first months of expenses for being here, like our rent, all of our utilities, closing out our apartment in Asheville. Like it would take every, it would take every penny that we had. Um, and we were going to be starting over like we were we were going to be at this place where we're nearly 30 years old in a new place. And we did the big move to the big city. And he and I are both entrepreneurs. We both work for ourselves and it may not work like, like this. All this could all come crumbling down. And it was yeah. ter it's terrifying. It's terrifying. And I took a week to um, binge watch TV. <laughs> and eat a lot of ice cream 
and self care is important. <laughs> yeah. And I grew up in a house where food was medicine. So that works out well. Um, <laughs> and I read, I read that, that week and I just read business books and I was trying to understand like what I could do differently and how I could go, where I could take my business and, and what I needed to do and how I needed to do a better job of trusting, how I needed to do a better job of allowing things to happen, how it was okay to have these down times and these, these kind of, um, these moments with nothing happening and that I could take that time to improve myself and my business. And, and I came back and Eric and I got our office set up uh, a week after, or actually the first week we were here and I just started going to work and I started creating content and I started talking to my community again. Like I had talked to them, to them before dad got sick. I mean, back in the spring I was, I was live nearly every day on Facebook or Instagram. I was Instagram storying all the time because I loved it. Like I wanted to connect with my community, but when dad got sick, I just couldn't do it. Like I could not hop on Instagram or Facebook and post some happy sappy, like yeah. flat lay bullshit post when my dad's like laying in a hospital bed, not able to feel his legs. Like I just can't do that. Um, and I use that, that time when we first got here to kind of reestablish where I wanted to go, look back at what I had done over the past year and a half in my business, realize that I had not been profitable, understand that my focus had been wrong. I was trying to grow too quickly. Um, take the time to really better understand how I could continue to speak to one person and market to one individual about one idea and what my audience really needed. And that's that my audience needed me to show up again. They needed me to not just talk to them about Instagram, but also talk to them more about life. You know, the week after my father died, um, I chose to use my Instagram to memorialize him and talked about my grieving process, like what, what grief feels like, how people don't talk about the physical effect of grief. Like I felt like my body was like chained to the floor. Like I couldn't move. I ached and I hurt. And I talked about my memories of my father and how he and I look like one another in our high school graduation pictures. And even, um, I go back home and people know me like, Oh, you're Biggins boy. That was my dad's nickname. Cause he was a big guy. And and those things and, and talked about memories together with my family. And then my, my dear friend, Sarah Jane, um, took over my Instagram for a week so I could just spend time with my family and, and do the work of, um, of grieving and planning my father's memorial and, and then get ready to move. And through that process, I realized that my audience and I, not just my audience, people are craving real connection. They are, they're, are really in need of real conversation with real people about real things and they can see through the bullshit. Like they can, they can see when all you're trying to do is contribute to the noise. So why am I so focused on posting every day to contribute to the noise of online marketing when I can cut through that noise with content that, that, benefits my followers and pours into their lives and helps them better understand who I am and who they can be and what I do for my business and what their business could be and having those conversations. And, and it really, it totally shifted how I approach business and what I do and also helped me realize that I had to change what I was doing in my business because I was one family emergency away from going broke, right? I was one, um, trip back home to Brevard, North Carolina, because someone got sick from not being able to pay our bills that the life that we had built while it's beautiful and it's Instagrammable was not sustainable. Mm. And it's really, it's been a really big wake up call about how, um, Eric and I have, have built our lives and what we value and, and how we spend money and make money and, um, and yeah, so, so really shifting my focus and, you know, that next week here in Chicago, I was able to land a few coaching clients. And the week after that, I was able to sign my, my biggest client that I've ever had. Um, and then the next week 
have more and more clients sign on for coaching and, you know, in that, that time here in sh- our first week in Chicago, our first month in Chicago, I went from having to drain our bank account to pay our rent for our first month here to making more money in that one month than I made this entire time. I've been an entrepreneur in my business. Um, and it's incredible. And I don't know, like, I mean, we can say it's a God thing. It's a universe thing. We can say whatever we want, but, or just, I don't know, someone's looking out for us, but it's also just trusting and believing that what, and I, and I hope everyone gets this too. It's not, it's not like who I am or what I'm doing, but trusting and believing that we all have something of value to contribute, that we all have something to say. And there's, there's always someone listening. And if we can just get clear on who that is and what we're saying and why we're saying it, that's when the magic really happens for our businesses and just being open to always learning. Like I am a know-it-all. I'm a freaking know-it-all and I know it. And it's so annoying, <laughs> but realizing through this whole process that I didn't know anything that I have so much to learn that I know just a little bit about one thing, but I don't know everything there is to know about marketing online or being a business owner or, or being a creative or being a partner or being a son or being a brother, any of those things. Like I always have something to learn. So I need to be open to reading and listening and watching and figuring out how I can do all those things better. I can always, but we can always be better. Uh, and that was another really big lesson from this summer. Mm-hmm. Thank you for sharing all of that. I, you know, it's, I don't know. I, I hate the word authenticity now, but it's, um, <laughs> you know, like that's kind of what my goal is with, with this podcast, because it's like, it's not just, I wanted to have you on obviously for Instagram, but at the same time, I think, uh, people going through real stuff, you know, and, uh, you outlined some of the worries there and, and, you know, one, your priority was your family. And, um, but I think all of us as entrepreneur entrepreneurs too, is like, uh, we do think we're one family emergency away from, you know, our business not doing it. And I'm the same way in my business. I literally have to be there and, uh, mm-hmm. I'm trying to figure that out. And, uh, what does it look like to have, you know, six months insurance or all kinds of things. And I'm going to have another guest on where he, uh, essentially broke his leg and he's a wedding photographer that shoots, you know, every weekend. And it's definitely not as intense as what you went through, but, uh, you know, he had to pay out of pocket to hire other photographers to cover for him. And yeah. that's like, you know, every, all the money in your account being drained before, you know, uh, yeah. for something that you would be making money off of. Um, you know, and I think those are just things that, uh, they're not the glittery and the glammy, but they are, uh, just so real and so, uh, I, relatable. I, it sounds so silly, but it's, um, you know, I think I felt like one of the followers that knew you more, uh, through that process with, with you and your dad. And then, mm-hmm. um, you know, I, it's so great for you to have a friend that you can reach out to and be like, Hey, cover for me on Instagram. Like, you know, me, you know, mm-hmm. you know, kind of my voice. And, and even if she didn't do anything, you know, uh, even, she did great but even if she only did a b plus levels of work but you know like your followers would have understood and like it you know perfection is not the game uh Mm -hmm. during that time so um yeah man so that's uh it's so tough now i want to like transition into uh ending wrapping this up but uh oh man i want to just want to give you an internet hug um and (laughs) uh, you i appreciate that next time go for it yeah i was just gonna say i think the issue of like as creative as being that like one accident or one emergency away from our businesses being nothing. Like, I, th- I, I mean, that's a big deal. It's like, it's a big, indi- it's a big issue within our industry. And, and I hope that conversations like this and the conversation you're having with this other guest, and I hope it opens up more of a dialogue for all of us to talk about what that means and what that means for pricing ourselves, what that means for profitability, for saving, for, um, how we are supporting one another as creatives and making sure that we are, are paying folks what they're worth. And I think it's a really big, a big reminder for all of us that, um, at the end of the day, like as business owners, we have to make money and it's okay to make money. It's not wrong to want to make money. Um, and, and yeah, I think it's just, it's a broader conversation that, that more folks in our space need to have. 
Yeah, absolutely. I agree. People, my big thing about money I've learned is that uh, just like alcohol or or drugs, this is getting weird for people listening, but uh, <laughs> it's a it's an accelerant of your personality. And, you know, money, if you're a generous person, money is going to not, it's already going to make you more generous per se, where uh, folks who aren't generous now say, oh, when I have more money, I'll be more generous. Or when I have more money, I'll start doing more work or I'll start, you know, pushing harder and, um, you know, the love of money is, is evil, but money is a tool, you know, that we need as business owners to uh, really to affect the lives that we want to help, you know, because again, <laughs> think of, think of the people that are listening to this for Instagram, but also the people that are going to relate to you, you know, like it's not about money or anything like that. But if we hadn't put that work into our business, we would have never found each other. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so yeah, I just want to, uh, ask you a few, uh, kind of fun questions, kind of do a lightning round just to, to keep it pumped and uh just to kind of get to know you a little bit better tyler what are is your favorite tv show and what books are you reading currently uh and what are your goals for the rest of 2017 so favorite tv show um i <laughs> i am a really big real housewives fan <laughs> and folks folks may know that from following me online if you follow me on twitter you definitely know that because i mainly just tweet about the episodes and trash talk housewives um <laughs> it's such a it's such quality programming oh it's so good <laughs> it's so good so i love real housewives just started the new season of american horror story and really liking that as well i can't wait to see how ryan murphy messes it up by episode six because that's what he does um Books I'm reading right now, I'm actually reading Perks of Being a Wallflower. It's one of my favorites. Um, I had my high school librarian, who is incredible, actually got me an autographed copy a few years ago. And she wow. recently gave it to me, which was so nice. Um, so I'm reading that. I read a bunch of business books. Like I said, when we first got here, read Profit First and loved it. The Brand Gap was another really good one. And then the one thing or three that really kind of moved me to action. Um but yeah, reading that Perks of Being a Wallflower for fun right now. And then the rest of this year, my goal is to get Follower to Fan Society launched, um, make it profitable from the get-go. It's a really big goal for this new product instead of trying to incorporate all the bells and whistles and everything initially. We're going to focus on getting it started and then as Amy Porterfield says, start simple, get fancy later. So doing that, um, have some speaking opportunities coming up this fall that I'm super excited about and just getting everything in line for 2018. Really my goal next year is to work less, be more profitable in my business and uh, have more of an impact. So if that means more teaching at events or conferences or more in, uh, Instagram or Facebook lives, whatever it may be, just expanding my impact in 2018. So I want to make sure I wrap up this year so I'm able to do that next year. Awesome. I love it. So uh, I'll link Instagram below, but uh, where can most people find you and uh, how can they sign up to be a part of the Follower to Fan Society? So you can find me on Instagram and Twitter and Facebook at Tyler J. McCall. Um, you can also join the IG Advantage, which is our free Facebook group about all things Instagram, online marketing and entrepreneurship by checking out tylerjmccall.com slash group or just searching for the IG Advantage on Facebook. And then the Follower to Fan Society is at follower to fan society dot com. And you can you can sign up there and join us and all the fun we're having in the society. Awesome. Thanks so much, Tyler. Hopefully people will check them out. And uh, I love it. Thanks so much, man. Yeah, thanks for having me. Wow. I, I know I always kind of sit here and reflect on the episode after it plays. And um, but man, that one just with Tyler, he's so authentic and just so uh, real about the real things in life, guys. You know, obviously Instagram is important and hopefully you enjoyed that. Uh, but if you got to the end of this episode and kind of heard more of Tyler's story and uh, how we should manage business during tough times and stuff like that, uh, hopefully you enjoyed that. So definitely keep Tyler in your thoughts and send him some love on Instagram. He would absolutely enjoy that. Uh, if you're not already joining the Patreon, you need to do so. We have a few spots left that are exclusive to listeners and it's just how to support the show. It's $3. It's super cheap. But at the same time, you get access to how I edit and how I run business. And you can ask me any question and we'll answer on there. So go to the link in the show notes. Say hi to Tyler and make sure that you uh, go check out the Patreon. Thank you so much for listening. 
I am so pumped for you guys and uh, where we're heading for this year. So have a great day. 